10 Incredible Mysteries of the Huns The Huns were an enigmatic, multi-ethnic confederation that controlled massive swaths of the Eurasian steppe between the 1st and 5th centuries AD. They swept in from the east, displacing entire civilizations in their wake. Almost nothing is known of these mysterious warriors, and what few historical accounts survive are predominantly anti-Hun propaganda. To this day, their origin, language, and impact remain shrouded in mystery. 10. The Scourge of God The Latin statement ego submetilla flagellum di, which means I am Attila, the scourge of God, is said to have been first expressed in 1387, and is obviously making a reference to Attila the Hun. Like other rulers regarded, by the West, as barbarians, including Gaizruk and Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun has a bad reputation amongst Westerners. This Hunnic ruler has been portrayed as an enemy of civilization, a ruthless mass murderer, and an uncultured savage. Nevertheless, this is only one side of the coin, as Attila the Hun also possessed some positive values, though often forgotten or not highlighted, that would be normally applied to the heroes of Western history. For instance, the historian Jordanes wrote that, he, Attila, was indeed a lover of war, yet restrained in action, mighty in counsel, gracious to suppliants and lenient to those who were once received into his protection. Attila's Early Life Little is known about Attila's early life. Although the exact date of his birth is unknown, it is possible that Attila was born sometime in the early 5th century AD. We do know that Attila's father was a man by the name of Manzuk, whilst his uncle, Rujla, known also as Ru or Ruga, was the king of the Huns. The name of Attila's mother is not known, though today, her name is sometimes given as Hanjis Vladi Serf. This name, however, is likely to have been a recent fabrication. Attila also had an older brother, Buddha, known also as Buddha, who many claim he later murdered, in order to unite the Huns and become their sole ruler. As young men, Attila and Buddha were probably taught archery, horse riding, and the art of war to prepare them, for their future role as leaders of the Huns. Additionally, it has been said that Attila and his brother were also taught Latin, and Gothic so that they could do business with the Romans and the Goths. Was Attila a family man? Rujla died whilst on a campaign against Constantinople in 433 AD, and the leadership of the Huns passed to Attila and Buddha, who ruled jointly. Buddha, however, disappears from history following the war against the Byzantines along the Danube. According to Jordanes, now when his brother Buddha, who ruled over a great part of the Huns, had been slain by his treachery, Attila united all the people under his own rule. It may be possible that Buddha died during the campaign against the Byzantines, rather than as a victim of Attila's plotting. Priscus, a diplomat who was part of the Byzantine embassy to the court of Attila the Hun, did not record the circumstances of Buddha's death, but wrote that one of his widows was a governor of a Hunnic village. It might be inferred that Attila respected his brother's wife, and provided for her after her husband's death. Attila's possible image as a family man may be seen in another section of Priscus' writings, but Attila remained unmoved and his expression unaltered, nor in speech nor action did he reveal that he had any laughter in him, except when his youngest son, Renek was the boy's name, came in and stood before him. He pinched the lad's cheeks and looked on him with serene eyes. Nevertheless, Priscus continues by saying that, I was surprised that he should take small account of his other sons but give his attention to this one, until a barbarian sitting beside me who knew the Latin language, warning me to repeat nothing of what he was about to tell me, said that the Sirius had prophesied to Attila that his race would fail, but would be restored by this son. A man of his word. Whilst it is indeed debatable whether Attila the Hun was a family man or not, it has been said with more certainty that he was, mostly, a man of his word, at least by the standards of his time. Priscus records that the Romans paid the Huns a tribute of 700 pounds, of gold each year from 440 AD to maintain peace between the two powers. Prior to that, since 422 AD, the Romans had been paying only 350 pounds of gold. Attila the Hun kept his promise, 
and did not cause trouble for the Romans as long as the tribute was paid. 9. Hunnic Language While the Mongol Empire was in the ascendancy, the power of the Catholic Church seemed to be fading, and the power of the Pope was somewhat shaky. At the same time, the Mongols opened the eastern roads for travel, and the Pope decided that there were now so many evident non-Christians, that his power in the West was under severe threat. If he could convert these non-Christians he could regain power. As a result, Jesuit missionaries started to head east. Before spreading Christianity, they researched Chinese beliefs. They examined Chinese history and philosophy. There were some missionaries who stayed 20 or 30 years in China, and built up healthy relations with Chinese scholars. They also started to translate Chinese books about both history and philosophy into Western languages. The first translations were made in Portuguese. Then this was translated to the other languages, Spanish, Italian and French. So the West started to learn about China from these Jesuit missionaries. Sin means China in Latin and Sinology means Sciences of China. Sinology mainly started with these translations in the 16th century, and Turk history became part of this study. Later, the number of Sinology studies increased, with many travelers from the West heading to China. The book written by De Guinness in the 18th century is accepted, as one of the important collected studies about Turkish history. De Guinness did not know Chinese but he wrote the history of the Turks, Mongols and Tartars by using Jesuit missionaries' translations. It was printed under the name of General History of Turks, Tatars and Mongols. All the information obtained to this point by the researchers showed that the Huns were of Turkic origin. We learn nearly all our current knowledge on the Huns, from the information left to us by their contemporary numbers. For example, it is pretty definite that their language was Turkic. Chinese annals reveals that their Hunnic language was very close to that of the Tolls, a Turkic tribe. The Byzantine Empire said that the language of the Huns was the same as the languages of the Bulgars, Avars, Zekolars, the last of whom were descended from the European Huns themselves, Ed, and other tribes which were flooding into Eastern Europe from Central Asia. The historians of that period accepted that these Turkic-speaking tribes were no different from the Huns because their languages were the same. There are many words written in Chinese chronicles, which were used by Huns in daily life. These are Turkic words. Keshratori, reading a Hunnic sentence which has survived to the present day, has proven that it is Turkic. Hunnic runic writings belonging to European Huns in Kafkasa, Tsik, has been read and has been proven to be of Turkic origin. One area for backing up this claim is that of Hunnic names. It is difficult to explain the names belonging to Asian Huns, because of fact that they were translated into Chinese in the form of Chinese names. The meanings of the names of European Huns can be comfortably explained in Turkish. One of the most striking features related to European Hunnic names is, that they can't be explained by any language but Turkish. Some of the names belong to the German language due to cultural interaction, but the majority of them are Turkish. 8. Zungnu. Between approximately 300 BC and 450 AD, there existed a nomadic group known as the Zungnu. Their ethnic identity has been greatly contested, but they were a very powerful tribal confederation, that were considered a great threat to China. In fact, it was their repeated invasions that prompted the small kingdoms of North China, to begin erecting barriers, in what later became the Great Wall of China. The Zhongnu formed their tribal league in the area, that is now known as Mongolia. It is believed that they stemmed from the Siberian branch of the Mongolian race, although it has been hotly debated whether they are ethnically Turkic, Mongolic, Yenizen, Tokharian, Iranian, Yaolic, or some mixture. Some say the name Songnu has the same etymological origin as Hun, but this is also controversial. Only a few words from their culture, mostly titles and individual names, were preserved in Chinese sources. It is believed that the Songnu created their empire under the supreme leadership of Ma Du Chanyu sometime around 209 BC. This political unification allowed them to build stronger armies and use better strategic coordination, turning them into a more formidable state. 
They adopted many Chinese agriculture techniques, built Chinese-styled homes, and wore silk like the Chinese. The Zhongnu worshipped the sun, moon, heaven, earth, as well as their ancestors. They formed a number of tribes, called the Chubai, Huayan, Lan, Luandi, Kailan, and Subu. The Zhongnu had an established hierarchy system. The leaders following Madhu Chanyu formed a dualistic political system, with branches to the right and left. The supreme ruler was known as the Chanyu and was equivalent to the Chinese Son of Heaven. Under the Chanyu were the wise kings of the left and right. Beneath the wise kings were the Gulai, Kulai, kings, the army commanders, the great governors, the Dungu, Tonghu, the Gudu, Kutu. Directly beneath them were the commanders of groups of either 1,000, 100, or 10 men. When a Chanyu died, power would pass to his son, or to a younger brother if he did not have a son of age. Although numerous skirmishes were fought between the Zhongnu and the Han Empire, in 129 BC, a great war broke out between the two archenemies. The Han Emperor wanted to form an alliance with the Yuezi people to fight against the Zhongnu, but these attempts were unsuccessful. 40,000 Chinese cavalry attacked the Zhongnu at the border markets. The war was difficult for the Han due to difficulties transporting food and supplies over long distances, and there was low availability of the fuel they needed to survive the harsh Zhongnu climate. Nevertheless, the Chinese gained control over the Zhongnu, causing instability and weakness of the Zhongnu Empire. Between 60 to 53 BC, the Zhongnu Empire faced a civil war. Upon the 12th Chanyu's death, a grandson of his cousin, known as Wayangdi, took power. This was viewed as usurpation, and led to turmoil. Few supported Wayangdi, and he eventually fled and committed suicide. As the lineage provided several heirs to the throne, there was disagreement as to who should take over as the 14th Chanyu. Those who supported Wayangdi pushed for his brother, Tuki, to be Chanyu in 58 BC. The following year, three more men declared themselves to be Chanyu. This led to a series of forfeitures and defeats. Tuki was defeated by Hu Han, and then two more claimants appeared, Hu Han's elder brother Zizi, and Runzin. Zizi killed Runzin in 54 BC, and only Zizi and Hu Han were left. Zizi grew in power, and Hu Han eventually submitted to the Chinese. After this, Power shifted back and forth between the Zhongnu and the Han dynasty for years, with many battles. After the Battle of Akbai in 89 AD, the northern Zhongnu were driven out of Mongolia, and the southern Zhongnu became part of Han China. Some believe that the northern Zhongnu continued west, came under the leadership of Attila, and took on the new name the Huns. The unique culture of the Zhongnu Empire was very powerful during its time. The fortifications that were initially built to keep the Zhongnu away were eventually transformed into the Great Wall of China. This demonstrates the size and power of the Zhongnu, an ancient nomadic group that played an important role in the history of Mongolia and China. 7. The Hunnic War Machine The steppe has produced many notable horse archers who brought terror and devastation to the known world during ancient times. But of the many steppe peoples who penetrated the civilized world, none brought more destruction than the Huns. Sometime during the mid to late 4th century, the Huns pushed westward. While on the move, they encountered the Alans. The Huns quickly engaged and slaughtered them. Afterwards, the Huns made an alliance with the survivors. With the Alans riding alongside the Huns, they headed towards the lucrative lands of Goths, particularly that of Gruthungs led by King Romain Eric, sometime in the 370s. The attack was so swift and relentless that the Goths could not halt their progress. Romain Eric could do little to thwart the Hun advance, and in despair, he committed suicide. With Romain Eric dead, another took his place by the name of Vithamaris. Vithamaris continued the fight, even hiring Hun mercenaries. However, it was all in vain. Vithamris could not defeat the Huns and eventually lost his life in 376. Huns in battle with the Alans. A 1870s engraving after a drawing by Johann Nepomuk Geiger. With Vithamris dead, 
Alavius and Saphrax took charge, as Vidricus, the son of Vithamris, was too young to rule. Rather than to continue fighting the Huns, they led the Gruthunks to the Danube River in 376. Furthermore, the names Alathius and Saphrax appear Alanic, and may have been of a Sarmatian, Alan origin. Besides the Gruthunks, the Thurvini Goths, led by Fritigern and Alavivus, also joined them to escape the Huns, and in hopes of seeking asylum in the Eastern Roman Empire. The total number of refugees is disputed. The 4th century Greek sophist and historian Unapius indicates, that 200,000 Goths appeared along the Danube, while Peter Heather suggests roughly 100,000. Whatever the number, the impact was great, not only on the Goths but also on the Eastern Roman Empire. Two years after arriving at the Danube, the Goths were allowed to enter into Eastern Roman territory. Once established, the Roman provincial commanders Lupicinus and Maximus took advantage of the refuges, leading the Goths to revolt which ended in a Gothic victory at the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Grand Ludovisi's sarcophagus, with battle scene between Roman soldiers and Goths. While the Battle of Adrianople on the surface has nothing to do with the Huns, most important is what lies beneath. The Goths, over a period of years, would not have trickled to the Danube, seeking asylum into the Eastern Roman Empire had it not been for the menace from the East. What the Goths knew the Romans brushed off. In the words of Ammianus, the seedbed and origin of all this destruction and of the various calamites inflicted by the wrath of Mars, which raged everywhere with unusual fury, I find to be this, the people of the Huns. The Huns were a steppe nomadic confederation that arrived in the area of the Black Sea sometime during the 370s. These strange invaders were not like other peoples in the area. Everything from their physical appearance to their mode of warfare was new and terrifying to the barbarians in their path, and to the civilization of Rome who would soon encounter them. 6. Hunnic Stonehenge A massive complex with stone structures has been discovered near the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea, in Kazakhstan. Analyzed to be around 1,500 years old, thus corresponding to the period when the Huns were moving across Asia and Eurasia, the Manishlik complex was most probably constructed by the nomadic tribes of the region. As for the sheer scale of the find, the disparately spread stone structures cover an area of over 300 acres, 120 hectares, of land, thus being equivalent of around 200 American football fields. Now from the archaeological perspective, most of the stone structures are not uniform in their size or shape. According to Andrea Stafiv, of the Mingisto State Historical and Cultural Reserve, and Evgeny Bogdanov, of the Russian Academy of Sciences Siberian Department's Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography, the smallest of the structures are only around 13 feet by 13 feet, 4 by 4 meters, while the bigger ones account for dimensions of about 112 feet by 79 feet, 34 by 24 meters. Interestingly enough, some of the stones are arranged in a manner similar to the renowned Stonehenge of Britain, with their vertical alignments rising sharply from the ground. And as with many of the recent archaeological discoveries, the initial finds were made by a metal detecting enthusiast, whose name is attributed as F. Akhmadulin in the published article concerning the site. Back in 2010, Akhmadulin was successful in identifying parts of an opulently crafted silver made saddle, along with other artifacts, in Alton Kazgan, near the eastern coast of the Caspian Sea. And fortunately for the researchers, many of the salvaged historical objects were directly brought to Estefiv, who was based in Akta. On further theoretical analysis, the archaeologists confirmed the precise location, which lies amid a sagebrush desert. But the socio-economic situation back then didn't allow for logistical support for an actual lawn field excavation. However by 2014, the archaeologists were able to assemble a team for the field work, and the consequent excavation project yielded an assortment of artifacts, including additional segments of the ostentatious, partially silver saddle and whip fragments made of bronze. The saddle in question, 
beyond its preciousness, also showcases the impressive craftsmanship of the ancient folks dwelling in the region, with detailed images of deer, boars and possibly lions. This brings us to the question, who exactly were the builders, and craftsmen of this massive complex situated within a desert? The researchers wrote dash, certain features of the construction, and formal details of the, stone, enclosures at Alton Kazgan allow us to assume, that they had been left there by nomad tribes. Now it should be noted that during the same time period, the Huns were expanding across Asia and Eurasia, and their advancing momentum in turn fueled a bevy of many migrations across the Eurasian steppes. Furthermore, from the historical perspective, the Huns in themselves were not of singular ethnicity, but rather pertained to a supra-tribe of sorts, composed of various sub-tribes from the steppes, and later even continental Europe. In any case, on a more micro level, the archaeologists assessed the saddle to be the property of a wealthy elite. To that end, other than just its silver bearing, the opulent object depicts symbols called tamgas, which were historically associated with people of privileged status. As for the actual purpose of this saddle being housed within the complex, placed on a stone structure, the researchers have hypothesized that it might have been associated with a ritual or was just a burial item. Pertaining to the latter, a skeleton has actually been found beneath the structure. However due to lack of detailed radiocarbon analysis on this front, the archaeologists are not sure if the human remains are from the same time period. Suffice it to say, there is more to discover, salvage and learn from the massive Manishlik site of Kazakhstan. In that regard, complemented by ongoing researching, the archaeologists are even looking forth to publish their second paper on the Silver Saddle in 2017. 5. Attila the Hoax An announcement was made that construction workers building the foundations of a new bridge over the Danube River in Budapest, Hungary, had uncovered an ancient burial chamber with researchers claiming that it belonged to the infamous Attila the Hun one of the most feared enemies of the Western and Eastern Roman empires in the 5th century ad. Word of the discovery quickly spreads around the internet, however, it now appears that the story was nothing more than a hoax. The so-called burial chamber, which historian Albrecht Rumstein, from the Laurent Davos University in Budapest described as absolutely incredible, was said to contain human remains, many horse skeletons, a large sword made of meteoric iron, pottery, jewelry, and other weapons and grave goods traditionally associated with the Huns, all pointing to the tomb being the resting place of a great Hunnic leader. The historian was reported as saying, this definitely seems to be the resting place of the almighty Attila, but further analysis needs to be done to confirm it. However, it appears that there is no Albrecht Rumstein from the Laurent Davos University, and the whole account was a dismal attempt to gain publicity. Evidence comes from the image the originating source published. Far from being the remains of Attila, this mummy originates from the Ming Dynasty in China. The Huns were a group of Eurasian nomads, appearing from east of the Volga, who migrated into Europe around 370 AD, and built up an enormous empire there. They were highly skilled at mounted archery, as depicted in the featured image. It is suggested that they were the descendants of the Zhongnu, who had been northern neighbors of China 300 years before. Attila was ruler of the Huns, 434 to 453 AD, and leader of the Hunnic Empire, which stretched from the Ural River to the Rhine River, and from the Danube River to the Baltic Sea. Attila led many military raids on both the eastern and western Roman empires provoking what has become known as the Barbarian Invasions a large movement of Germanic populations that greatly accelerated the fall of Rome. He is considered by most Hungarians as the founder of the country. According to ancient records, Attila died in his palace across the Danube after a feast celebrating his marriage to a beautiful young Gothic princess named Dildico. Legend says that his men diverted a section of the river, buried the coffin under the riverbed, and were then killed to keep the exact location a secret. It would have been a fantastic finding if Attila the Hun really had been found. The discovery of his funerary site could bring many clarifications concerning the origins, 
and identity of the Hunnic people and of Attila himself, which have both been sources of debate for centuries. Sadly, the originating website have used this desire for knowledge to mislead and misinform people. Slight problem, there is no Albrecht Rumpstein, and the remains belong to Chinese Ming Mami. The story was a promotional stunt by fake news site World News Daily Report. Ancient accounts indicate that Attila died on the night of his wedding to Gothic princess Ildiko. According to legend, his men diverted a river and buried Attila in the riverbed. The workers were then slaughtered to keep the grave's location a mystery. 4. Deep Native American Connections Recently at a conference, I was talking to some folks about DNA and the migration of tribes based on haplotypes. A question came up, what about the Huns? I had to answer that I had never looked into the Huns. That night I started looking for evidence that the Huns left a genetic footprint. I usually take the DNA of an individual and work backwards to find their origins. In this case, I started with the origins and tracked forward in time. The Huns were a nomadic tribe of people that arrived from Eastern Asia around 150 AD. They built a European empire that lasted until 469 AD. The height of the empire was under the reign of Attila. The Huns were not a homogenous group. They integrated those that they conquered. The Alani and the Ostrogoths were a few of the assimilated groups. Their DNA would have been Eastern European, perhaps R1A, G2A. I want or I too and a minority proportion, but the core and the majority of the Huns, based on historical reference, would have been East Asian. By the end of the Hunnic Empire, the Huns had spent over 300 years, 12 generations, in Europe. Unlike the later Mongol invaders, the Huns had no Asian home to return to. They, in turn, were assimilated into the cultures they once ruled and left descendants across Europe. Most likely the Huns were from Eastern Asian origins. That limited them to Hapla group C-Mongol, D-Tibetan, N-Han slash Finn, O-Manchurian and Q-Altaic. The ethnic descriptions that I'm using are overly simplistic, just enough to give you a feel for the possible cultures present. I surveyed DNA record sources for Russia and Europe, looking specifically for those Hapla groups. Groups D and O were isolated individuals, easily attributed to Silk Road travelers who settled in Europe. Group C was predominantly C3 and related to the later Mongol invasion. N was either heavily Finnic or a few isolated Siberian individuals. Q was a different story completely. Hapla group Q has origins in Siberia, most likely north of the Altai Mountains. Q is also the origin of the Native Americans. The majority of the Native America Hapla group is Q1A3A. What I found was a significant Q1B and Q1A2 population in Eastern Europe. When I mapped the Q1B genetic footprint using Tribe Mapper they fall exactly north of the Danube River and east of the Rhine. This corresponds to the territory of the Hunnic Empire. The Q1A2 group maps to Hungary, the royal seat of the empire. These Q1B and Q1A2 are close-knit tribes each with common ancestry within the last 2,100 years. The timing of their common ancestry and their geographic footprint make a strong argument that these two Q groups were the genetic core of the Hun invaders. A few caveats. Not every European in Hapla group Q is a Hun. There is a population of Q1A3A, a closer relation to Native Americans, living in Sweden that doesn't correlate. Not every Hun is a Q, there are bound to be some other groups mixed in like the isolated and individuals, as well as the folks the Huns picked up along the way. When we think of the Huns, probably the first person who comes to mind is Attila. Attila was the second to last ruler of the Huns at the height of the empire. He died in 453 and the empire crumbled in 469 AD. There is no evidence to say that Attila fits into either the Q1B or Q1A2 group. If I had to pose a theory, I would say that Attila is Q1A2, part of the royal class of Huns living in Hungary. The Huns, Q1A2 and Q1B, and the Native Americans, Q1A3A, share a common Asian ancestor around 18,000 years ago, 
most likely from the Altai mountain region. Not all of the ancestral Q1A3A traveled to the New World. Some remained in the Old World and are found across Siberia and into Scandinavia. If you live in the Americas and you have been tested as a Q, don't automatically assume that you are Native American. Get a deep clade SMP test for confirmation. The combined evidence of DNA, geography and history leads to the conclusion that at the end of the Hunnic Empire, the core East Asian Huns assimilated into the Eastern European cultures. They left behind a strong genetic footprint in the same territory that they historically inhabited. The next time I'm asked, what about the Huns? I can point to Europe and say, they're still there. 3. White Huns the paucity of record in Hephthalites or of Thalites provides us fragmentary picture of their civilization and empire. Their background is uncertain. They probably stemmed from a combination of the Tarim Basin peoples and the Uach. There is a striking resemblance in the deformed heads of the early Uach and Hephthalite kings on their coinage. According to Precopius's History of the Wars, Written in the mid-6th century, the Hephthalites are of the stock of the Huns in fact as well as in name, however they do not mingle with any of the Huns known to us. They are the only ones among the Huns who have white bodies. If Thalites was the name given by Byzantine historians, and Hyodlates by the Persian historian Merkant, and sometimes Yitai or Hua by Chinese historians. They are also known as the White Huns different from the Hun who led by Attila invading the Roman Empire. They are described as a kindred steppe people originally occupied the pasture lands in the Altai mountain of southwestern Mongolia. Toward the middle of the 5th century, they expanded westward probably because of the pressure from the Wan Wan, a powerful nomadic tribe in Mongolia. Within decades, they became a great power in the Aixus Basin, and the most serious enemy of the Persian Empire. At the time when the Hephthalites gained power, Kushan and Gandhara were ruled by the Kadarites, a local dynasty of Han Orkanites tribe. The Hephthalites entered Kabul and overthrew Kushan. The last Kadarites fled to Gandhara and settled at Beshawar. Around 440 the Hephthalites further took Sogdian, Samarkand, and then Balkh and Bactria. The Hephthalites moved closer and closer toward Persian territory. In 484 the Hephthalite chief Akshan War led his army attacked the Sasanian king per Uz, 459-484, and the king was defeated and killed in Khorasan. After the victory, the Hephthalite Empire extended to Merv and Herat, which had been the regents of the Sassanid Empire. The Hephthalites, at the time, became the superpower of the Middle Asia. They not only destroyed part of Sasanian Empire in Iran, but also intervened in their dynastic struggles when the Sassanid royal, Kabad, 488-496, was fighting for the throne with Balish, brother of Peraz. Kabad married the niece of the Hephthalites chief, and the Hephthalites aided him to regain his crown in 498. After conquest of Sogdia and Kushan, the Hephthalites founded the capital, Bianjakant. 65 kilometers southwest of Samarkand in the Tsar of Shan Valley. This city later reached its prosperity, produced one of the best mural paintings in the 7th century, and later was destroyed by the Arabs. The Hephthalites chose Badakhshan as their summer residence. Their chiefs lived north of the Hindu Kush, migrating seasonally from Bactria, where they spent the winter, to Badakhshan, their summer residence. Under the Hephthalite control, the Bactrian script and language continued to be used, and trade and commerce flourished as previously. With the stabilization at the western border, the Hephthalites extended their influence to the northwest and to the Tarim Basin. From 493 to 556 AD, they invaded Khotan, Kashgar, Kacho, and Karishur. The relationship with Wanwan and China were tightened. The Chinese record indicated that between 507 and 531, the Hephthalites sent 13 embassies to Northern Wei, 439-534, by the king named Yidai Ilichu. During the 5th century, the Gupta dynasty in India reigned in the Ganges Basin, with the Kushan Empire occupied the area along the Indus. India knew the Hephthalite as Huna by the Sanskrit name. 
The Hefthalts or Hunas waited till 470 Rig after the death of Gupta ruler, Skandagupta, 455-470, and entered the Inda from the Kabul Valley after the conquest of Gushan. They mopped on along the Ganges and ruined every city and town. The noble capital, Pataliputra, was reduced in population to a village. They persecuted Buddhists and burned all the monasteries. Their conquest was accomplished with extreme ferocity and the Gupta regime, 414-470, was completely extinguished. For 30 years the northwestern India was ruled by Hephthalite kings. We learned some of the Hephthalite kings ruling India from coins. The most famous ones were Tawarmana and Mihrakula ruling India in the first half of the 6th century. There are numerous debates about Hephthalite language. Most scholars believe it is Iranian for the Peshi states, that the language of the Hephthalites differs from those of the Wanwan, Mongoloid, and of the various Hu, Turkic. However there are some think the Hephthalites spoke Mongol tongues like the Xian Pai, 3rd century, and the Wanwan, 5th century, and the Avars, 6th 90th century. According to the Buddhist pilgrim Sung Yun and Hua Sheng, who visited them in 520, they had no script, and the Liang Shu specifically states, that they have no letters but use tally sticks. At the same time there is numismatic, and epigraphic evidence to show that a debased form of the Greek alphabet was used by the Hephthalites. Since the Kushan was conquested by Hephthalites, it is possible they retained many aspects of Kushan culture, including the adoption of the Greek alphabet. It is equally inconsistent while comparing the references to the Hephthalites religion. Although Sun Yun and Hua Sheng reported that the Hephthalites do not believe in Buddhism, though there is ample archaeological evidence that this religion was practiced in territories under Hephthalite control. According to Liang Shu the Hephthalites worshipped heaven and also fire, a clear reference to Zoroastrianism. However the burials found seem to indicate the normal practice and disposing of the dead which is against Zoroastrian belief. Very little was known about these Hephthalite nomads. Little art has left from them. According to Sung Yun, and Hua Sheng who visited their Hephthalite chief at his summer residence in Badakhshan and later in Gandhara, the Hephthalites have no cities, but roam freely and live in tents. They do not live in towns, their seat of government is a moving camp. They move in search of water and pasture, journeying in summer to cool places and in winter to warmer ones. They have no belief in the Buddhist law, and they serve a great number of divinities. Other than the deformation of skulls, the other interesting feature of the Hephthalites is their polyandrous society. The records of brothers marrying to one wife had been reported from Chinese source. Between 557 to 561, Persian king Chosros allied with another steppe people who had appeared from Inner Asia. Ursos wanted to profit from the situation to take revenge over the defeat of his grandfather Peraz. He married a daughter of the nomadic chief and allied himself with them against the Hephthalites. The chief Sinjibu was the boldest and strongest of all the tribes, and he had the largest number of troops. It was he who conquered the Hephthalites and killed their king. Mercilessly attacked on two sides, the Hephthalites were completely broken and disappeared by 565, that only small number of them survived. Some surviving groups living south of Ixus escaped Chosro's grass plate or fell, to Arab invaders in the 7th century. One of the surviving groups fled to the west and may have been the ancestors, of the later Avars in the Danube region. The decline of the Hephthalites marked the turning point in the story of the steppes. Another era was opening in Central Asia. For the allies of Chosros were Western Turks, a new power was to dominate the steppe for the next few centuries, too. Hungary and the Huns. Every second summer, the outskirts of the village of Bugak resound to beating drums, whip cracks, traditional Turkic music and the rumble of galloping hooves as people and horses gather in the dusty steppe of central Hungary. Many come clad as if ready for medieval battle, in leather and metal armor and wielding swords and shields, while others carry banners and strike resonant metal singing bowls that bear strange runic symbols. They are here for Kuraltaj, 
billed as a tribal assembly of the Han Turkic nations, a celebration of the preservation of their ancient traditions, which last week and drew more than 250,000 people from as far apart as the Balkans, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. Groups representing some 27 nations reenacted battles and performed displays of everything from horsemanship, hand to hand combat, and archery, to folk singing dancing and shamanic fire and drumming rituals. A bare earth arena, where the mock fights and high-speed horseback shows took place, was flanked by the bright flags of all nations present and yurts, stages and stalls, all presided over by huge portraits of a glowering Attila the Hun. We've been here several times and it's a great event, said Potter Vladov, a Bulgarian in a purple, red and gold tunic whose sword-carrying friend wore an animal skin draped over his head and bare to Warsaw. Rain and Fazana, two ethnic Uzbeks from Germany, wandered through the throng with their three young children, who wore leather jerkins trimmed with fur and carried small bows slung over their shoulders. We've been to Kurultaj before as well, said Rain. Our husbands are demonstrating how ancient Turkic tribes used to fight. The vast majority of visitors were Hungarians however, and Kurultaj is inspired by a theory that their ancestors, the Magyar, originated in Central Asia and have deep historical, cultural or even genetic links to other nations from that region. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Hungarian Protestants living under adamant rule in Transylvania enjoyed great religious freedom in stark contrast to the persecution suffered by their co-believers in Habsburg lands. After Hungary fought for independence from the Habsburgs in 1848-9, several senior revolutionaries and their soldiers found refuge in the Ottoman Empire, during the 1912-13 Balkan Wars some Ottoman troops fled to Hungary, and in the subsequent First World War the Ottomans and Austria-Hungary were allies. Belief in a lost but glorious Eastern past, and hostility to Israel and to liberal US and European powers which it sees as Hungary's perpetual oppressors, even wove a surprising pro-Muslim thread through Hungary's far-right Jobbike party. That thread snapped with Europe's refugee crisis last year, which saw Jobbike follow the hard-line anti-immigration policy of Hungary's populist Prime Minister Viktor Orban. While calling refugees and migrants from the Islamic world a threat to Europe's security and identity, however, Orban is still pursuing an economic eastern opening to boost Hungary's trade with the Middle East and other regions. And while sponsoring lurid billboards and radio announcements warning of the dangers posed by the mostly Muslim asylum seekers, Orban's government also funds Kurultaj alongside Muslim states like Turkey and Azerbaijan. Kurultaj is about a time before Christianity and Islam, when the Huns and the Turkic peoples were pagan brothers, said Zabalx Molnar from near Budapest, who wore a traditional Hungarian embroidered shirt, baggy black trousers and a fur-trimmed felt hat. Now, in this time of trouble, it's good to remember where we all come from, and the ancient things we have in common. 1. Amat Kerkoller. In December 2014, the Kyrgyzstan Ministry of Culture announced that a 5th-century Hunnic gold collar recently sold by Sotheby's had been taken from the country illegally. On December 3, the Amutkar collar sold for a staggering $380,215. Sansa's Bay Amutkar acquired the woven gold necklace set with glass and garnets around 1890. The high-status artifact with dragon head terminals remained in his family's collection in Bratislava until 2013. East Hunnic jewelry is extraordinarily rare. Finding a complete royal collar in the homeland of the Huns is nothing short of spectacular. The Huns introduced dragon and beast head terminal necklaces and to works with their expansion west. This style of jewelry has popped up from Central Asia to the Carpathians. Hans were master goldsmiths. However, they relied on imported, pre-cut stones like the ones in the Amutkar collar. It is unknown whether the piece was intended for a man or a woman. Eric Bijst, Sotheby's European sculpture and works of art specialist, commented, I was intrigued when I first saw the collar as its opulence, and forceful decoration immediately evoked the great power of the ancient ruler who wore it.
even fragments of Eastern Hunnic jewelry are exceedingly rare, so finding a complete collar which originated in the region where the Huns first emerged is nothing short of spectacular. It is a privilege to handle a seminal work of art made by one of the formative peoples in world history, a people that ruled from the Atlantic coasts in Europe to the plains of China. Attila and his Huns are seen in the West as barbarians. In the late 4th and 5th centuries they viciously subjected all of the European tribes, and forced Roman Constantinople to pay vast sums of gold just to keep the Hunnic horde out of their cities. Attila and his Huns are seen in the West as barbarians. In the late 4th and 5th centuries they viciously subjected all of the European tribes, and forced Roman Constantinople to pay vast sums of gold just to keep the Hunnic horde out of their cities. Such an image has endured to this day but when faced with the finesse of a major piece of Hunnic craftsmanship, a sense of their sophistication is immediately apparent. The workmanship of the Cloisan Dragon Terminals is typical of many Hunnic period ornaments, where craftsmen had access to garnet stones of excellent quality. Whilst their gold working techniques were superbly controlled, the workshops relied upon traded stones pre-cut to certain shapes, such as the rectangles on the Amutker terminals. The length of the Amutker collar would have encircled the neck, to rest on the upper chest region of either a man or woman. The back ends of the terminals are open sockets fashioned to receive the strap ends. Each dragon has a ribbed loop in its mouth to tie the two ends together, and the fastening ties were probably weighted with the two beans that accompany the collar, to hang down the wearer's back. According to ancient records, Attila died in his palace across the Danube, after a feast celebrating his marriage to a beautiful young Gothic princess named Dildiko. Legend says that his men diverted a section of a river, buried the coffin under the riverbed, and were then killed to keep the exact location a secret. During the Hunnic period the economic and cultural exchange between East and West had conspired to produce exceptional objects, and the re-emergence of this royal collar is of value not only to scholars, but also to collectors of exquisite and rare jewels.